Can I start off by, though, thanking you very much, Hillel, for inviting me here. And um, I would, I'd also like to take the opportunity of complimenting you and UN Watch on the fantastic work that you do. I think you show an example to all of us in battling injustice at the United Nations. So thank you and keep, keep at it. Um, I, I'm going to just speak briefly about a report that I was involved in writing for an organization called the High Level Military Group. The High Level Military Group, which I'm sure you've all heard of, um, is a group of 14 retired generals, admirals, air marshals, who, um, whose, whose role really is to, um, is to study conflict, modern day conflict, and learn lessons that are applicable across from one country to another. And that includes, of course, the war in Gaza. And we've conducted a number of studies into the Gaza conflict as well as into the conflict and potential conflicts in Lebanon and elsewhere. Uh, and w when I say retired generals, I'm talking about mainly retired chiefs of staff. For example, we have the former British Army Chief of Staff, we have the former Canadian Army Chief of Staff, the former Indian Army Chief of Staff. There are generals from around the world um, who, in their own time, go and visit countries such as Israel and learn and understand what happens so they can make recommendations. And we conducted an investigation during and immediately after the 2021 Gaza conflict and came up with a number of uh, observations from that conflict, which I'm going to run through briefly now. First of all, the causes of the conflict, which obviously are, I'm not going to go into detail about this because it's very complex, but obviously are presented very often as being the result of Israeli-inspired violence in Jerusalem, which Hamas was responding to, whereas those of us who understand it know very well that the cause of this conflict was not Hamas defending Jerusalem by firing rockets at the uh, Zionist entity. It was a power struggle between Hamas and Fatah. Uh, it, it, surrounding the election process that was taking place that was cancelled by Abbas because he reckoned that Hamas was going to win the election. And by firing rockets, obviously, it, it was aimed at strengthening the hand of Hamas uh, over Fatah in, in future uh, issues. It's more detailed and more complicated than that, of course, but th that's in outline the reality. I just want to mention also the role of Iran in all this. Iran encouraged this conflict, and it didn't just encourage it by funding Hamas and even more so Palestinian Islamic Jihad and providing arms for the organizations and sending Hezbollah members to encourage them when they may be flagging somewhat. Uh, it also deliberately and specifically encouraged this particular war, and there are reports, media reports, that, that show how Iran did that. So Iran is playing a significant role, was playing a significant role behind the scenes in the conflict, and they claimed to have established a uh, Hezbollah on their behalf, in fact, claimed to establish a joint operation center in Lebanon, which included Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, an arm of the Iranian government, to direct and coordinate operations against Israel in this conflict, from which m missiles not just fired from um, from Gaza, but also from Lebanon, albeit relatively uh, ineffectively. Hamas's strategy, I think probably you don't need to remind me of, remind you of this, but Hamas's strategy is, is one thing, and that's the destruction of the State of Israel. It's laid down specifically in their charter. They talk about it all the time. It's no secret. That's their aim, is to annihilate Israel and to turn it into an Islamic State. Hamas's operations, the way they conduct that, the way they go about that at the moment, is to um, initiate conflict at low level or at high level, such as we saw in May, which is intended. They know, they know they can't destroy Israel. They can't militarily, seriously impact Israel. But they, 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 they also know they can tr do their best to isolate Israel in the international community by firing missiles, carrying out tunnel attacks, carrying out other forms of attacks against Israel, which will force Israel to react. And when Israel reacts, using Hamas human shield tactics, they ensure that there are civilian casualties, which can be used as a weapon of war against the Israelis. And it's the, if, uh, if you would class Hamas as an army, it is the first army in history that has ever deliberately 
attempted to create casualties among its own civilian population for its military aims. Hamas's weapons and tactics in this conflict, pretty much the same as they have in previous conflicts, and this is a little bit, bit like Groundhog Day here at the United Nations, because periodically Hamas trigger a war, periodically the United Nations convene a commission to, uh, to condemn Israel for the war that Hamas has triggered. But as in the past, they've used tunnels, and the tunnels, I think, the, the underground tunnels are network in Gaza, which have been known as the Jihad tunnels, um, are, were the main, main weapon behind of, of Hamas in this conflict. That was their main intention, because they expected to lure Israel on the ground into Gaza, not just from the air. They expected them to come on the ground. And those tunnels are to both ensure the safety of Hamas commanders, but also to main, to have movement of fighters, logistic movement, etc. But primarily, they're there to, to, to try and lure Israeli forces in and then be able to attack them from behind or from all directions from these tunnels. Uh, they fired about 4,500, give or take, missiles at the Israeli civilian population, uh, of which only 175 hit populated areas due to Israel's defenses above all. They launched six suicide drones against Israel, all of which were shot down. They attempted to launch a submersible to carry out an attack against Israel. That was destroyed by Israel as well. And they attempted a border attack tunnel, f sending fighters under the border using their, one of their tunnels, which is a tactic they've used very often before. They, um, they, they also, they, 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 they conducted a number of operations that prevented um, essential services from reaching the Palestinian people in Gaza such as they shut off the power to desalination plants and sewerage facilities, causing not just problems within Gaza, but also environmental damage on a large scale. They damaged six out of 12 power lines that Israel provides power to them to Gaza from. Uh, and they, uh, w w when under UN negotiation with Israel, the Eretz crossing was opened uh, to, to let in humanitarian aid, they then attacked that operation, killing two civilian aid workers and wounding six other people, including IDF soldiers who were protecting them. So it's not just attacks against Israel. These are uh, service attacks against their own people. On the Israeli side, the, <coughs> the Israelis um, refrained from attacking Hamas prior to this conflict, prior to the intensification of the conflict, deliberately carrying out limited response only to sporadic missile fire in the, in the months preceding the conflict in order to avoid causing escalation uh, and hoping to get, uh, you know, to, to deal with the problem through international diplomacy. And during this conflict, Israel prevented every single attack, every single attack that Hamas attempted to carry out with Iranian backing, except for a small percentage of rockets and some anti-tank fire. The, the reason that they were very successful in this conflict, Israel, in terms of protecting its people, uh, 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 really twofold. First of all, really defensive, the Iron Dome. The Iron Dome, without the Iron Dome, a, not, a lot more Israeli people would have died and a lot more Palestinians in Gaza would have died because had it not been for the Iron Dome, which is actually a weapon that doesn't just protect Israeli civilians but protects Gaza civilians as well, had it not been for the Iron Dome, if these thousands of missiles had not been shot down, then they would have caused a lot of casualties, and Israel would have had to go in very much harder and very much faster without being able to take the care they were able to take because of the shield of the Iron Dome. Secondly, and a very well-developed Israeli shelter system, early warning system, and drills. On the offensive side, the high-level military group concluded that Israel carried out unprecedentedly precise uh, and precisely targeted destructive attacks against Hamas's systems. Not seen anywhere in war before, at this level of precision, even in previous conflicts in Gaza. Israel has developed its tactics and capabilities and weapons to the extent that the precision they were able to use was absolutely unprecedented in order to preserve civilian life, both on the Israeli side and on the Gaza side. The, the, they carried out over 1,500 uh, attacks against separate targets. Um, 
and, and uh, they, they neutralized 114 Hamas terrorists, including commanders. When I say neutralized, it's not clear, killed, wounded, whatever. Uh, and they destroyed 60 miles, more than 60 miles, of the tunnel system underneath Gaza. And that is uh, assessed as being probably the majority of those tunnels. There may well be a lot more, but there's certainly more. But it was a significant amount. And when I tell you 60 miles plus was destroyed, it suggests that um, it's a hugely extensive network in which vast amounts of money that was provided mainly to support the population in Gaza was used on this purpose. Targeting by Israel, they only targeted known military objectives. Um, they never once during the conflict deliberately targeted a non-military objective. Obviously, in some cases, there were side effects um, where, for example, a, a house was struck containing a military objective which contained also maybe a great deal of explosive which caused collateral damage beyond that. But that wasn't the intention, of course, of Israel. They applied the laws of armed conflict, not just as they're written, but above and beyond, well above and beyond the requirements of the laws of armed conflict. They confirmed every target they struck with multiple intelligence sources. They took legal advice from their lawyers in the IDF before carrying out every attack, with very few exceptions. In some cases, attacks had to be personally authorized by the chief of staff if they were particularly controversial or particularly risk collateral damage, personally by the chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Force who authorized dozens of these attacks. They sent phone warnings, as Hill mentioned, um, to tell people to get out of the buildings they were in if they were about to be struck or to get out of the area. They carried out knock on the roof, which means deploying a, a low caliber explosive, which causes a loud noise but doesn't kill people, to warn people if they didn't leave as a result of phone calls. They carried out real-time visual surveillance to confirm the evacuation of civilians from certain areas. And sometimes uh, they allowed hours after a warning before a strike took place. The only occasions when they did not give such warnings were when they were targeting high-value targets, and that particularly means Hamas, senior Hamas commanders, who if you'd warned them, of course, they would be gone, and that would, be, uh, that, that would uh, seriously damage Israel's war effort, which was, of course, to a large extent to kill uh, Hamas commanders. Uh, just just a, as a, a point of interest, th there are many pieces of footage that you may have seen of civilians in Gaza taking photographs of buildings that were about to be hit from quite close to those buildings, which suggests that they were warned, you know, they were obviously warned, but it suggests that they knew <coughs> not only how precise, but also how little collateral effect it would have if they were right next to those buildings. Um, that's something I don't think we've seen before. I won't go into detail. There were cyber operations attempted by Hamas, which were to try and, uh, and jam the Iron Dome system, which Israel overcome, overcame. rather. Just briefly on the casualties, um, there were 234, and some of these figures may be disputed. The, the figures I get are from the Mayor Emit Intelligence Center, which probably provides the most reliable basis for casualty figures, but th th these are the latest ones I've seen from Merrimit. 234 killed Palestinians in Gaza as a result of Israeli action. Of those, 114 belonged to terrorist organizations, and 11 more potentially belonged to terrorist organizations. On the Israeli side, Hamas killed 12 Israelis with rockets, um, wounded 352, and killed an Israeli soldier with a um, an anti-tank missile attack. One, one notable casualty statistic is, which, which is an event that caused the most, the single most number of casualties in Gaza during the conflict was on the 16th of May when there was an airstrike on a tunnel which ran under a road. And Israel was very careful not to target um, the tunnels when they were attacking them in areas where they could cause a lot of collateral damage. But in this case, the tunnel collapsed. It had been built under the road and it also extended under houses and the, the tunnel collapsed and houses collapsed in on the tunnel. So that was collateral damage and killing the largest single number. Um, 
Hamas killed during the conflict, Hamas killed 21 of their own people by, by, by either misfires of rockets or rockets falling short that were aimed at Israel. They killed 21. That means that, and they, they, or they, they killed 13 Israelis. So they killed more of their own people in this massive attack than they killed Israelis, which is quite a telling thing. And in, when you look at um, the ratios, Israel killed 51.7% civilians and 48.3% fighters, which is a very, compared to other conflicts, and it's very hard to compare casualty rates in different context, conflicts, but compared to other conflicts, that is an extremely high rate of competence to civilians killed. Hamas, in their attacks, remember, Israel killed 51.7% civilians, 48.3% combatants. <coughs> Hamas killed 92.3% civilians and 7.7% combatants. The only other thing I want to say, really, that, that's, that's basically the summation of the report. It's available online. At, sorry to be, have such a contorted email address, but if you want to read the report, it's high dash level dash military dash group dot com um, the, the, the only thing I would say is that, that what we found during our uh, examination of the conflict was the direct opposite of what the United Nations Human Rights Council is alleging not just slightly different but a hundred percent different where Hamas attempted deliberately attempted as a policy to kill Israeli civilians and to lure Israelis to kill their own civilians. Israel did everything they possibly could and far more than most other countries could even achieve, probably far more than any other country could achieve in preserving the life of enemy civilians while, try, while being a very effective at destroying their military infrastructure. And the kind of comments and the kind of analysis you get from the United Nations Human Rights Council does one thing above all, it encourages Hamas to maintain this policy of attempting to lure Israel and force Israel to kill its own people. Above all, that's what it does. Therefore, the UN Human Rights Council is guilty of perpetuating these conflicts, causing bloodshed, and this report will ensure there will be more of these types of attack. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Kemp.